Welcome to this Checkout Steam Kits webinar. My name is Paula Newcomb and I am the Northeast Regional Coordinator from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. Today I am at the Kendallville Public Library and I will be the host and question moderator for today's webinar. Our presenters this afternoon are Beth Monk, Children's Services Manager, Marie Kaufman, Teen Services Manager, and Leah Dresser, Adult Services Manager. They're all from the Kendallville Public Library. And I'm trying to get my slide to move and it's not moving. Okay. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few announcements. The Indiana State Library has many ways to stay connected to the library staff across the state. Here you'll, you'll see our various social media accounts listed. I have also included the link for our new professional developments archive training website. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, e The Wednesday Word. We also offer a blog with, which provides information about the state of in, state, Indiana State Collection, interview spotlights on library staff from across the state, and information about upcoming events at the Indiana State Library. This webinar is provided as part of the Library Trends and Hot Topics series. To register for other webinars available or trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library events calendar, which can be found at our website at library.in.gov. Included on this calendar are events at the Indiana State Library and other library events around the state of Indiana. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, please see our continuing education website. Let's hold off questions till the end of our webinar because we have three different presenters. So um, if there, there should be plenty of time toward the end of the webinar for questions. This session is one hour, so you'll get one LEU for today. I will be sending those out within 30 days of this presentation along with a recording link in case you want to refer to it in the future. If at any point during the webinar you experience any technical issues, please enter your issue in the chat box. So without further ado, I will now turn the presentation over to Leah. Hey, thanks for joining us in sunny, beautiful Kendallville, Indiana today. Um, here's our agenda. We're going to start by talking about Cortex kits. Um, then Marie Kaufman will talk about steampunk programming. And then Beth will finish up with Cortex Corners and her STEAM kits. And then finally, questions and answers at the end. OK, getting started. Why did we start Cortex kits? We started <clears throat> by having our Cortex, um, which is our maker space. It started off kind of slow, which every training we went to mentioned that it would be really slow. And unless we were willing to offer classes and trainings, it would have a, st a slow start. So we ended up um, starting these Cortex kits in order to lessen intimidation for ease and accessibility and to add marketing to the Cortex. Um, our next step was to form a committee. Um, our committee consisted of a person from each department, children's, adult, teen, our marketing person, and our IT manager. Um, we considered funding. Um, just recently, um, someone suggested kit sponsorship, which we haven't looked into as of yet, but it's something to look forward to in the future. Um, our policies, as far as circulation goes, you can see our beginner's quilting kit. Um, it lists um, the checkout policy, how long people can have it, um, how old they need to be, and that, the fa and that they're holdable. Replacements. Um, each person, each kit has someone else that will check it in. Marie is responsible for the Lego EV3 Mindstorm kit. That's the most difficult and it has the most pieces. We haven't had any problems with it until the other day when someone turned it in with missing three pieces. Or was it one piece? Five, Five pieces. So, and But I think she only charged like a very minimal fee of 50 cents <laughs> to replace those, which even though her time is worth much more. Um, storage for our kits. Some of our kits are in um, the bags that they came with for the factory, um, like our telescope kit, our metal detector kit, and then also our um, photo studio kit. The other kits are just in heavy-duty Tupperware containers. <clears throat> 
you need to know your community. And we decided after our first kits, we decided what could we do to make people come into the Cortex more. We had a pretty slow start. So we put out a survey on SurveyMonkey. And if you click on it, oops. We just started it and the newspaper put a link to it and this just describes what all we, what the Cortex is for. And then if we go through, you can kind of see some of the questions like which branch do you visit the most, what we already have in our Cortex, which so far in the Cortex we have a 3D printer, digital sewing machine, embroidery machine, and then we just listed quite a few different options that people could, what they could want and then suggestions that they had. Um, people really, really, really wanted a pottery wheel, but we don't have the ventilation for that. So right now it's not, it, we didn't add it, but we did end up adding a telescope kit, airbrush kits. Um, the most popular suggestion was the VHS to DVD digital file converter, um, and then the GoPro kit. So we added all those. I don't think as of yet we have added a 3D scanner or the pottery wheel, um, but we did add most of these other things. Um, the hardest part, I think, for people was when they had to um, explain the concept of a maker. We just wanted our, our patrons to just come in and make anything. We don't care what they make. We just want them to come and experience technology and just make things. And then we wanted to know what would make people come into the Cortex. And then, of course, like I said, in that training that we went to, it did mention if you're not willing to offer classes and workshops that no one that your um, cortex would not, or that your makerspace would not be successful. So we wanted to know if we did offer those, when would be the best times. And then we just thanked them for doing the survey. So like I said, we put that on our Facebook page. We put that, um, the newspaper put a link in there for us, which was really nice. And then also on our um, website. Okay, the next thing you can do is to open your closets. A lot of the things that we ended up adding to the Cortex kits were things that we already had. Um, we created um, a live foosball court for summer reading last year. Well, when I say we, I mean Beth Monk, the children's manager. So in order to do a live foosball game, we had to build a foosball court. In order to make that, we did have to buy a post hole driver. Here's just a cute little picture from the Journal Gazette, which is the Fort Wayne newspaper where they put a, they came and took pictures because they thought it was really neat, which of course it is. So instead of just having a post hole driver that you only use one time, we turned it into a kit. So if anybody wants to check it out, then they can. Um, another thing that we did was um, Mindy Patterson, our previous adult librarian, um, had bought a Makey Makey for different programs. So far, we haven't really been too successful with um, finding other uses for it. But this video makes it look really cool. If anyone has any ideas, let us know at the end.
Okay, so those are just some ideas that they, the company recommends doing. So far, we have not had a single circulation on our Makey Makey, so we must just not be marketing it to the correct people. And then one of our most popular items is the GoPro camera, which we already happen to have. And we um, sometimes during programs, we strap it on a kid. And then the child wears it. And then it's great advertising for the Cortex kits and for our programs. Um, here, um, it is important to consider your storage and where you're going to put your kits. These are our current kits. We have a telescope, the Makey Makey, the metal detector, quilt rulers and tools, our Lego Mindstorm EV3 robot, a planetarium projector, jewelry making kit, and you can see all of the other ones. Um, some of them are pretty big, so they do take up a lot of space. For example, we keep the metal detector and the telescope in the actual cortex, and if someone asks for it or puts it on hold, we're more than happy to get it out. We do keep the kits near the adult area, near the adult reference desk, and the cortex itself. That way, if we see someone looking at it um, and they have questions, we're happy to answer their questions and to let them know some of the different policies and procedures. We do have cake pans, which aren't currently part of the cortex kits, but um, they're just kits nonetheless that people like and to check out. And then marketing of our kits. Word of mouth is really our most popular way to say what's going on at the library, along with Facebook, um, our newsletter, brochures, and our make and take projects. We just recently have started putting projects in the Cortex where people can come in and make them. Our most popular one to date has been our wood project. You can come in, use our Cricut to make a stencil, paint it, stain it, and then take it home. The response to that was overwhelming. We had so many people come and do that, and now they look for our, what we have going on each month. We try to do two different projects each month. Um, we also ask that people send us pictures of things that they do with our kits to our Facebook page, and then we'll post those. Um, so yeah, here's my contact information. Thanks. Um, next up is Marie Kaufman. She's gonna talk about um, steampunk programming. Hi folks, um, this is Marie, and like Leah said, I'm going to talk about steampunk programming. The first thing I want to talk about is my background. Um, just to kind of show you to not be afraid to try steam programming. So my background, um, my undergrad majors are in history and English, so nothing to do with science. And then I went straight to graduate school and got my degree in library science. And even though that has science in the degree title, I really don't know um, a lot about the hard sciences. So um, you can start from nothing and you can still do it. So these are some of the resources um, I use to get my projects from um, and then also where I get my supplies from for those projects. One of those is um, Make. Make is a magazine. Um, but they also have a website. Um, they have some pretty detailed projects um, that you can get um, your ideas from. Um, but my favorite is actually a website called Instructables. Um, it is basically Pinterest that works, in my opinion, <laughs> um, just because when you go to it, um, every project that you click on, um, there's instructions for it. Um, the links work, you don't really have to search for the source product. Um, so if you're looking for tech projects, this is, um, it's user created, so there's always projects being added, um, and you can search with key terms and find exactly um, what you're looking for, whether it be basic or advanced. Um, another resource I use is Spark Fun. Um, they have some um, projects on their site as well. 
Um, I buy most of my supplies from Amazon, Jameco, and SparkFun. Um, I would say I get probably about 85% of my stuff from Amazon, um, just because they're the cheapest. And um, But you want to make sure you plan ahead if you're order, ordering from Amazon, because a lot of the times um, the cheapest stuff comes from China, so it might take a month or longer to reach you. Um, so just a heads up if you're ordering from um, Amazon and wanting the most cost-effective products, because uh, sometimes it can take a little while uh, to get your supplies. So here are some of the projects I've done. Um, this one I called Roly Poly LED. Um, it's where we used a metal ball uh, to roll around um, a cup lid um, to light up the different LEDs as it goes around. And I'll show you this video of it working. The second one is the wobble butt. Um, so what I used was a CD, a cup, um, some wires, a switch, um, and a three volt coin cell battery to make a little robot that wobbles around. Uh, the kids really enjoyed that one because uh, it kind of turned into a battle bot sort of thing, so they positioned the cup in uh, different places and tried to destroy each other's creations, so that's always fun. Um, this next one is what I uh, call the infinity mirror. Um, so this one's a little bit more complicated, but um, not too difficult. Use some LEDs, a 3-volt coin cell battery, wires, uh, copper tape, um, a thin mirror film, and a mirror on the back to make it look like um, those lights go on and on and on for infinity. That was a recent project. And this last one I'm going to show you, uh, which we did a couple weeks ago for Valentine's Day, is the glowing heart where we painted a little um, heart plastic contraption thing. Um, we used a switch, wires, 3-volt coin cell battery, and an RGB LED that flashes in different colors. All right, so those are a few of the projects that I have done. Um, and don't be afraid to try them and fail, because trust me, I've tried things and failed. Just make sure you plan ahead and um, try the things you think you might want to do before um, you actually put them on your list of programs, because some things have not worked. So it's uh, you want to make sure you work ahead, um, but just don't be afraid to try something, even if you think it might be too difficult for you. All right, next up we're going to have Beth Monk. So there's Marie's contact information. And hello, everyone. I am Beth. And um, I want to start out talking about the Cortex Corner activities that we do in the um, for the children's department. Um, and we started doing these mostly because um, the Cortex, when we first started it, we had lots of rules in place about who could be in there and when you could be in there. Um, doors were locked until you passed different tests, which, of course, is for the patrons' safety as well as ours. Um, but we had lots of kids. Um, mine included, who wanted to go in there and use some of the equipment we had uh, because they're getting the idea of the maker space thrown at them at school every day, all day. So they don't have some of the um, nerves about using the tools that some adults might have. And, and they wanted to jump right in and start using things, but our policies didn't allow for that to happen. And really they still don't allow for that to happen without parental support or um, in a program. And so that's kind of the direction we went. We decided to start um, a couple of monthly programs that allowed 
uh, the children's department to kind of commandeer the cortex for an hour and guide students through a project um, using some of the tools in the room and getting them comfortable with being in there as well as their parents and a lot of their parents do stay and help them which is lovely um, so some of the pictures that you see on this slide are showing uh, some of the kids learning how to sew a sword using a couple of sewing machines that we have um, my favorite picture is the one with a, there's two grandmothers working with their grandchildren and one of our staff members um, and you'll notice that they're boys using sewing machines um, I loved this program my son came in and used the sewing machine and he was so excited to go home and tell his dad that he made a sword using the sewing machine. Um, so super cool project, great introduction into using a sewing machine, but also the parents then seeing that their kids could do these projects with their support um, at the library. Um, another picture that's on here is the robotic hand program that we just did. Um, and I did this program because whenever I go to the schools, and talk to the kids about maker spaces. We talk a lot about the big projects that we've all heard that students are creating or, or patrons are creating across the country in their library's maker spaces. We've heard the stories of the student who printed his own braces at the library, and we've heard the stories of the little girl who um, printed fingers for a friend. So um, those are great stories, but to make it a little bit more real for our community, we did, using cardboard and straws and some string, we had them make very basic robotic hands. So it kind of brought those stories then to life for them. Um, we also did demonstrate and show them how the 3D printer works and talk about where they can get ideas to print. Um, and we've seen our 3D printer used a lot more often because of programs like this and the Make It and Take It projects that we've had going on each month. Um, it's kind of reducing the fear that people have when they step into a room with expensive equipment. Um, and so to, to continue on here, there's obviously new experiences. I've covered some of that. Um, but it's obviously hands-on. Your parents are there. But there are things that these kids might not ever get to do at home or at school. They just don't have the connection to do those. Um, so this opens that door for them. Um, for me, one of the big things is the links to the school. Um, I do um, visit schools, as does my staff, every day during the school year, and we do different kinds of lessons, everything from um, STEM programming and makerspace ideas to um, reading stories and running book clubs and stuff in the classrooms. So anytime we can connect what we do here at the library with what we're already doing in the classroom, um, I feel like that kind of strengthens our ties. Um, so the Dancing Princesses, that we have on this slide was connected to a circuit lesson that we had just completed in our fourth grade classrooms. The kids are learning about how circuits work and how electricity works. So then coming in and making or having the opportunity to make this dancing princess um, was a natural tie-in. Um, a little caveat here, Marie suggested that you try everything ahead of time and make sure you order your supplies in advance. Um, this, while this project is super cool, um, we have had lots of trouble making it work. We had one student who came into the Cortex Corner and was successful to get their dancer to dance. We're not sure what goes wrong with this program, um, but it might be the kind of wire we're using or the size of battery isn't big enough. Not sure, but that's something that we ne didn't necessarily prep well enough for and um, have definitely learned our lesson. So we will do better next go round on that. <laughs> Um, so STEM kits. We all know that STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. We've had it thrown at us for days and days and days, right? Um, but attending the ALA conference in Orlando last year, I went to quite a few sessions on STEM and STEAM, and a lot of the things that kept coming back around to me were that people were talking about STEM in different terms. So instead of just science, talking about it in a social aspect, um, that it links people with similar interests together. Um, it starts new conversations. Um, and, and so I like to think about it in both of these ways. So socially, it's, it's a connection piece for people, but it's also a way for them to gather at the library in new and different ways. It isn't just about coming to the library and getting a book, but it's about experiencing something new or creating something new. Um, T for technology can also stand for together. Um, and so this is obviously connects to the social aspect where they're with their friends 
um, but also with students from other schools in your district or with their parents or as in the sewing project with their grandparents. Um, so it allows them to um, add va it adds value to the project if the parents are there or the grandparents are there and it's something that they do together that they're um, seeing their child learning and developing. Um, engineering can also stand for everyone. Obviously you're starting to see a pattern here. It ties with the together and the social. But other than that, it's that there's access to everyone. It's an inclusive type program. So students who don't have access because of whatever reason at home to a GoPro now can come to the library and they have the same access as everyone else. Um, if they don't own a sewing machine, we have opened that access to them for that in our Cortex as well. Um, it also allows them to take ownership um, of their library. We all know that if you, you give kids some boundaries and some responsibilities, that they will then run with that and they feel like it's partly theirs and they're going to take better care of it um, and, and they're going to contribute to it more um, than if it's just someplace they run in and out of or they have to visit to get a book for AR or whatnot. So being able to come in and design something on a 3D printer and then print it, um, it becomes a little bit of, of theirs then and they can realize all the possibilities of what can be done with that machine um, and any other machine in our cortex. And the last one, because I'm a children's librarian, um, math can be fun, but what is more fun is getting messy. So I like to include this one in here because you can have an art kit that gets, allows students or patrons to get extremely messy and have a great time with it. Um, you can create a volcano using different tools from your kitchen and make an absolute mess. And, and it's, it's fun. There's the science in it, the technology, engineering, and math, but it's also messy. Um, it also helps on a comfort level. If, if you're not afraid to let it be messy, when we were doing our make it and take it wooden signs, it was messy in that room. Um, there were brushes and paint and the smell of stain um, in that room. And I think it just lowers the, the terror that you walk into a room with all this expensive equipment. So it'll, it allowed people to look at it in a different light. Um, take a deep breath and think about what they really could do in this space. Um, and then I just I kind of put all of my thoughts on this into a sentence at the bottom here. Um, the experiences we offer at the library are wonderful. They absolutely have value. But let's face it, when kids come to story time, they come one hour a week. If what we really want is for the parents to repeat what we've taught them in that one hour for seven days out of the week every day at home. And the same thing is true with these kinds of activities. A makerspace is fantastic, but if you can give put those components into a kit and allow them to take it home, it extends the library and it places the library in their home, which makes it more impactful for everyone in the community. Um, okay, so going backwards a little bit here, when I first started here at the library in 2003, I believe, um, we had a ton of kits that we called Book Buddies kits, and they were put together for us um, in collaboration with um, the Early Childhood Alliance and the Deco Foundation, a foundation we have here in town, um, and they, they covered all different things, but they were huge kits, big bulky kits with lots and lots of parts. Um, they had multiple books on the topic, so in the right hand corner of the screen um, at the top you'll see that this kit had tangrams in it, it had Play-Doh rollers, it had um, art paddles or color paddles, different um, dot painters, all sorts of different things. And this was, these were components from an art kit. Um, and it was huge and it was messy. And when it came in, no one was happy. We always loved to watch them go out, but we hated to watch them come back in. Um, there was a lot of cleaning and a lot of counting and a lot of replacement parts being done. So much so that we would set kits aside, and when I say we, I mean me, um, I would set them aside and they would sit for weeks on end until I finally dealt with them. So the turnover in kits was a really long time period um, because we almost always had replacement pieces or broken pieces. Um, and since the kits were so large, it just you had to redo the content sheets and redo um, the cataloging information if you removed something. It was just a huge process. Um, and we used to say we loved to hate them. We loved that we had our patrons had the access to them, but we hated dealing with them after they came back in. So we had, over time, have phased most of those out. 
Um, and we're looking at doing some different kinds of kits because they do still have value. They did have value. Um, and, I, and that was, again, when I was uh, at the ALA meeting in Orlando, and I went to a Spark session where Jennifer Rounds from the um, Burlington Public Library in Washington State was talking about her STEM kits. And the more she talked about it, the more it, it made me think of what we have or what we did have, but it was so much simpler. Um, and so you can see then on the left side of your screen uh, the way the world STEAM kit. So they found some of the tools that they already had in their closets. That's one of the most valuable places you can look when you're starting these kits. What do you have for story time um, that just sits on a shelf until you use it once or twice a year? Um, put it in a kit because someone is going to find value in that. But you'll notice on the sheet it talks about it's a fun way for you and your child to play with weights and measurement, um, which obviously if you're playing with that, you're going to be using some of that vocabulary that they'll be learning later in life. Um, and it has a very simple content sheet. Um, there are two scales. There are 20 weighted numbers. There's a ruler. Just very, very simple. They also included a couple of books in their kits, which obviously adds value as well. But so much easier than this huge, massive kit we used to have. Um, some other kits that they had um, was a marble run, they had a light kit, um, they had sound kit, a magnets, tangrams, and force and motion. And I was really excited about all of these um, because my staff and I plan lots and lots of science lessons that we do every day in classrooms on these subjects. And every year we dig out the mater materials that we had and we do it for all the fourth grade classrooms or all the third grade classrooms and then we store the materials in our storage rooms until the next year. Um, it just makes more sense to have it out and, and available for others to use. Um, you still have a lot of parts in some of these kits. The Make Machines kit, you can see all the gears and all those pieces. Someone's still going to have to count those. But as Leah stated early on in this webinar, have a policy in place. Know who's going to take care of what and when they're going to do it. Um, when pieces, pieces are going to need replaced, um, are there consumables, and all of those things so that you have a plan in place for, for what's going to happen next. Um, here are some of our more tech um, kits that we have right now. Um, again, check your closets. We had bought Dot and Dash, the robots to use in our story time um, programs, and then they sat on a shelf. So in an effort to get the biggest bang for our buck, we started circulating them. And, and then I had a panic attack about kits coming back broken and sitting on shelves for weeks at a time while we waited for replacement parts. Um, and so we decided to purchase two of these kinds of kits so that one was on the shelf um, and one was in our office. Then when one checked out, um, it was with a patron, and when it came back in, it would come in the office, the one in the office would go out on the shelf, and we could then test and make sure that the one that just came back worked and had all of its piece, pieces and parts. Um, and that way it gave us a little bit of time if we needed to reorder supplies, um, but also that we wouldn't charge patrons for something that maybe the previous patron had done to a, a tool or a piece that they had lost or whatnot. Um, these kits, doing kits this way also allowed us to um, I guess it made me feel like, as the person who's responsible for the budget in my department, that I was able to really truly look at that, the newest and coolest things that were out for kids. Um, it justified the expense of the purchases. Instead of buying a coda pillar to use in a story time for a month and then sitting it in a closet, I could have it check out. And um, teachers could use it in their classroom when they're talking about basic coding. Or preschool students could have it as a station in their daycare classroom. Um, so when you're thinking about it in terms of the circs that you're going to get, the more users, that cost is um, more reasonable for you to justify. Um, the code, the robot mouse, I'm sorry, that kit we purchased and has already been through two of our elementary schools, K through five classrooms. Every classroom has used that mouse. And I've actually had requests from our high school that they wanted to know what the limitations were for that mouse because um, they don't want to use the plates. And I don't, if you don't know about this mouse kit, um, it comes with these green base plates. And um, the mouse knows to move forward 
the length of that plate with each command that you give it or to turn left based on the command and it, and it knows the distance of the plates but it can also follow commands without the plates and so they wanted some of their freshmen to work on their measurement skills and their um, problem solving skills to code the, the mouse to get from one place to another without the plates meaning they have to measure and make up without any markers um, the maze for the mouse to get to the cheese so the possibilities are endless. It does come with a set of cards to give instructions for the mouse, um, but you can also make your own mazes and different things with this. So already that, that mouse kit has paid for itself two or three times over. It's, as I said, it's been in so many classrooms. Um, and we did the same thing with the, this and the Coda Pillar that we did with Dot and Dash. I bought two separate um, items, one to keep in storage to replace the one once it's returned. Um, just to keep that lag time down to a minimum. Um, in the bottom right hand corner you see um, our launch rockets and we currently only have the compression, the compressed air rocket launcher and that one is going to be a kit that's more for our older patrons, um, third grade and up, but I know that we're going to have littler kids who want to check out this rocket kit. Um, I have some great rocket books I want to put with it. So we're also purchasing one of the little stomp rockets um, that they can use as well. And, and it, it will definitely be more kid powered than the compressed air. It's a little bit safer for our younger patrons. So kind of think about that too. Who are your kits um, geared towards? What ages are you going to put on it? Um, all of that would need to be covered in your policy and in your cataloging records. So we're not checking things out to people that maybe aren't a good fit for them. Keep in mind, to advertise these new things with teachers, daycares, and preschools. That, those are easy static, um, static audiences that you can always have access to very easily and they will jump on board. So where did I get my supplies? Um, there's tons of places. I did not put Amazon on here, but Amazon is a great place to go and order these things. You can sometimes get them cheaper through Amazon than any of the places listed here. Uh, also, Barnes & Noble had a great sale at Christmas on some of these tech tools, so I actually got the Coda Pillar from them because it was about $20 cheaper there than anywhere else. Um, but these are just a few of the other companies that we use. The Lakeshore Learning, you've probably, most of you have used Lakeshore Learning for different things. Um, I love them because their materials are meant for mass use. It's not a single home use kind of thing. Um, if you think back to the, I just, now I just lost it. Those, those material, those books, oh, what are they called? They're not leapfrogs, but before that, that we used to have. Do you remember those kits, Jenna? With the pencil that you could follow along and read? Okay, I don't remember. I lost it. I'll come back to it. But you want to make sure that it's going to stand up to multiple families using it and multiple people using it and not being something that's going to break that, that's going to be real flimsy. So using Lakeshore Learning is usually a safe bet. Um, another one that I have listed here is Blue Orange Games. Um, the, the lady from the Burlington Public Library, she um, directed me to, towards the Blue Orange Company. Uh, they have lots and lots of different science games um, that you can put together in a kit very, very simply. Um, the problem here is, is they will not let you use tax exempt if you order online. You have to send an email to them with your tax exempt number and every item that you want ordered in an email. Then they will send you an invoice for that. That is the only way that they will honor your tax exempt status. Um, they do have some really cool stuff. It is worth the checking into. Um, sometimes you can get their products then through Amazon. Um, but if not, sending the email isn't that big of a hassle. Um, next is the Pitsco Education Company. This is, they have a wide variety of materials, but most of them are put together in classroom size kits. So if you do programming um, the way that we do programming, where you go out to a school and um, see um, every fourth grade in your district or whatnot, having a kit that you can purchase in one fell swoop put together for you already separated with the instructions can be beneficial. If you're also going to do 
a STEM day at your library and you want a couple of kits that are already put together for you, this is a great place to go for that. They are expensive, I'm not going to lie, um, but sometimes you have to do your cost-benefit analysis. How much time are you going to spend finding bits and pieces versus just ordering it one fell swoop from Pitsco? Um, I also love ScienceWiz. ScienceWiz um, kits the website you can order from the website. They also have a lot of their books and materials and kits at Hobby Lobby. Um, occasionally you'll see them at Barnes and Noble and other stores like that. But these are very, very simple, basic materials to get you started on putting together a STEM kit or a STEM program. Um, okay. Um, the, the science whiz things go back to where I said thinking about how many uses they're going to get. A lot of the things that I ordered from science whiz to use or bought that were science whiz, they're, they're not meant to stand the test of time of many students in many classrooms playing with them or using them. So you, you would get your ideas from there and then go somewhere else if you're going to put it into a kit. Um, Mindware is a great website. Um, Thames and Cosmos is a great website for different games and activities. They actually have um, a really cool boat engineer kit that would be great if you've done the Project Wild training, not Project Wild, Project Wet training, um, and you do the boat building activity. Um, and they also have what, one I'm really excited to purchase, which is a Hoppy Atoms kit. And so it talks about breaking down what an atom is and how they work and how they, um, how everything is connected together. It's a great, it's a great kit. I can't wait to buy that one. Um, and then totes. Oh my goodness, you will never buy more totes in your life than you will buy if you start doing these kinds of kits. I feel I have said in the last week that I buy more totes than I do books sometimes, and it's a true statement. Um, but you want to make sure you have the right size totes that do latch and close, um, and know that you're going to have some place to store all of them. If you don't have the space to store all of them, put a binder out that has pictures of them so patrons know that they can request them from you. Um, when you're thinking through this process of kits and which kinds of kits you want to do, think about the consumables. Um, are you going to have things in your kits that, that people use and you have to replace every time they circulate? If so, what kind of cost are you willing to cover for each circulation? Um, the Burlington Public Library does allow consumables in their kits. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to go that direction so far. The answer is no. Um, but you'll, you'll have to weigh that. And you can always go to her website or Google their, their library and look. Um, she was very, very gracious and sent me all of their kit instruction sheets um, and the items that they put in them and why they put them in there. And, and I love the layout of their sheets. So we're, we're not copying, we're sharing. It's what libraries do best. And we are now, I hit my 40 minutes, woohoo. Um, <laughs> I got real nervous. Um, <laughs> so here's my co contact information. And I know I went through that fast. We all kind of did. Um, so if you have questions, go ahead and um, type your questions, and we'll try to address those now. So one person asked if it was a Questron pen. Is that what it was? No, no. It, was a, it was a kit that it was kind of like a leap pad. But you put you could change the books out of it, and the book like kick clicked into the device. I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, it did not stand the test of time here. That's all I know. Okay, we've got one person typing. So if you have, you know, say if it's an adult, teen, children, or just in general, I guess. So we'll see what we've got. What's the loan period? Um, What's the loan period for the kits? Um, they're just, it's just a, 14 days. It's they're, 14, holdable and renewable. they're holdable, they're renewable, it's a 14 day or a two week checkout. Um, we do not post the cost of the kit on the kit or on the record. In most cases, not in the children's department we don't. Do we on the Cortex, Cortex kits? The Cortex yeah. kits do have the price on there so patrons are aware. Okay, any other questions? We're always available by email. You can give us a call. 
Um, we're more than willing to talk to you about any of this kind of stuff um, and address any questions you have then as well. Okay, maybe we've got someone typing. What kind of kits would you recommend for a library with a smaller budget? Um, that's a great question. If I were you, I would go to your story time closet and to the closets where you store your materials and look at what you have in there. Um, do you have a button maker already? Can you put that in a kit? Can it be out as a make and take activity? Um, do you have Duplos? Put a Duplo kit together and um, toss a book in with it that encourages building. The Iggy Peck Architect book would be a great book to put in with a Duplo a um, bunch of Duplos and let that circulate to start. Um, what, what other kinds of things do you have that you can, that you use in story time, maybe on a regular basis, maybe not, that would have a wide appeal? Or, or what do you have that you can connect to a book that isn't a consumable? It doesn't have to be a lot of, of pieces. It doesn't have to be a lot of things. Um, when we put the, st the Stomp Rocket kit together, it's going to be the Stomp Rocket which you can get those for about $25, and a book about rockets. That's it. OK, we've got two more questions. Another one was, do folks need to check out the kits, or can they just use them in the library? Oh, that's a sticky question. <laughs> um, they have to check them out. Even if they're using them in the library, they have to check them out. Because if something happens to it while they're using it in the library, a piece is lost, the camera gets broken, they're still responsible for it. So it has to be checked out. Another one, it's again for children's. So, um, would you be able to share some of the instructions for the kits? They love the layouts of them. Yes, um, shoot me an email and I will send them to you. It looks like we've got a few more people. There's just a slight delay in what gets typed. Okay. How do you get your managers and library board on board? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> and <laughs> I would say that communication is key. Uh, invite them to the meetings, put them on the committees with you. But also, you know, we've had in the last has it been six years, we've had we've, we're, we're on our third director. Um, our, the first director that we had moving into this building, she left before we moved into the Cortex. Um, movement really, um, but she was always on board with whatever was best for our patrons. Um, our next director uh, was not focused on the, the Cortex or our STEM programming at all, um, but kind of let us run our departments for the most part. Uh, but our current director was a teen librarian. So that's, I mean, that's the key. Like she knows what the kids are looking for, she knows what patrons are looking for, and she's willing to try and fail. Uh, and let us let us um, kind of ask for forgiveness sometimes in, in what we're spending money on. It's it's definitely I know it's a sticky situation for a lot of people that, that you don't have the open ability to to run your departments the way that maybe you would like to run sometimes. But I guess I would go to them with uh, with an idea in mind. What kind of policy do you have in mind? You've already talked to the circulation manager, so she's on board or he's on board. Um, and, and talk about what limitations you're going to put in place. And then talk about the CERCs that you think you're going to get out of this. Because the CERCs, at the end of the day, are going to justify the expense you put into something. Um, and the d new people you're going to reach. It's going to reach people that aren't just coming in to look for the newest fiction or um, newest DVD. It's going to reach a different kind of demographic. And, and so you're, it's a way for you to broaden your horizons, if you will. Okay, a couple more good questions. Um, were the kits primarily funded through library budget or through grants? Um, mostly through our library budget. When we started the Cortex, um, we're, there's lots of libraries who write a big grant and they completely restructure their library or do a new construction project for a makerspace. We did not do that. Um, we repurposed what we had. I think the most we spent on it that the year we officially kicked it off was $5,000. Um, and a lot of the things that we put in there, our die cut machine, our button maker, our book binder, 
Um, those are all things we already had in different places. So um, we, we were able to, to put things like that in there for no cost at all because we already had them. Um, the things that, that have the highest circulations currently for us are things like our planetarium, which was cheap, um, our telescope, our microscope, our GoPro, that's expensive, but like I said, we already had it for marketing, um, and Legos. Do you have a Lego club? Throw some Legos in a bin. Obviously this, um, what is it called? EV3s is not just normal Lego, so that there is an expense there, but it's something that you will get the value back from in your circulations. Okay, another one. Do you have patrons leave deposits at the checkout or, or only for lost and damaged materials? Nope, they only pay for lost and damaged materials. And sometimes that even depends. I mean, that's a, again, cost benefit. Are you going to um, charge them for... The EV3s, again, is a little bit different, but if for my Duplos, am I going to charge them because it's supposed to have 50 Duplos and I only have 49? No, I'm probably going to call them and say, find, see if you can find it. If not, I, you know, I have a bin of Duplos. I'll toss another one in there. Okay, these are really great questions. Anybody else have any questions before we wrap it up? Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you so much to Beth and Marie and Leah here today at the Kindleville Public Library. Again, um, I will be sending out the LEUs within 30 days of this presentation. Again, if you do have last-minute questions, we'll be on here for probably the last 10 minutes or so, or next 10 minutes or so.